Welcome to Life is Beautiful. I'm Anthony. Today, I want to talk to you about uh, something a little odd, something a little bit weird. And uh, coming out of Germany, of all places, today I want to talk to you about German Kartoffel beer. We are going to be talking about German potato beer. And I know that might be rather shocking to some of y'all, rather surprising, because uh, when people think about German beer, one of the first things they usually think about is the Brandeiskabot, which is the Bavarian purity law that forbids, it's forbidden to brew any type of beer with anything that isn't water, malt, hops, and yeast. So I want to talk a little bit about what exactly Kartoffel beer is, why Kartoffel beer is, why did they brew a potato beer, and most importantly, why does it still exist today? You'll see that the Kartoffel beer looks pretty much just like any other pale lager that you would expect out of Germany. And to be 100% honest, it smells and tastes like it too. Nothing really about this stands out or screams potato at you. And that's because Kartoffel beers are typically just normal, regular beers which utilize potato starch as an adjunct to drastically reduce the quantity of grain utilized in the mashing process. The potato starch actually ferments so cleanly that it leaves behind no residual sensory characteristics of the potato, resulting in an incredibly clean tasting beer. So breweries who would oftentimes struggle with uh, poor harvest, poor crops, uh, malt usage limitations and restrictions, they looked for those alternative sources and potato was the king. Most sources I can find on Kartoffel beer came from research journals of the mid 1800s with the earliest account written by a Viennese brewing scientist named Julius Thausing. Being from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Thousing was not restricted or limited in the same sense that his Bavarian brethren to the north were. Uh, he was able to do way more experimentation, and uh, he was one of the, the founders, the major pushers behind utilizing uh, potato and pa potato derivatives in the brewing process. Thousing had this to say about the potato. Under some conditions, the importance of potatoes as a brewing material cannot be denied. Thousing uh, not only pushed for and experimented with potatoes, but he also uh, captured the idea behind uh, other historical uses of it. Uh, apparently in Bohemia, uh, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at this point in time, uh, brewers there had been experimenting with potato starch and uh, potato derivatives for some time, and he found their beers to be of an exceptional quality, unable to be determined from other uh, all-malt alternatives. Julius noted that Bohemia brewers who had been experimenting with potato starch actually claimed that a uh, hundred parts potato by weight were the equivalent of 150 pounds of barley by weight. So uh, when I say it's more efficient, it's way, way more efficient. Once word of this got out, everyone was trying to experiment with Kartoffel beer. Uh, as I mentioned, Bohemia and Austria were well ahead of the game, but uh, even the North Germans started incorporating it into their styles, their Helles lagers, their exports, uh, even some of the more niche beer styles still in that brilliant pale approach, like the Broihan, uh, a sour beer from northern Germany. Uh, there's annotations of it being used, uh, brewed with potatoes as well. Brewing with potatoes rapidly caught on. It was a huge success. Uh, people loved it, and brewers especially loved it because of all the money that they were saving. But it also had some advantages. Uh, there are notes saying that the potato starch in beer actually helped kind of stabilize it, helped it prevent uh, overcarbonation because it fermented so cleanly. It actually helped with oxidative properties and allowed the beers to remain more stable and able to be dispersed and uh, shipped out much further. Kartoffel beer solidified itself uh, amongst the Germanic brewing culture, the brewing identity. All up and down the uh, Rhine River, you were able to see Kartoffel breweries pushing their potato beers. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, and uh, that happened around the early 1900s, around 1920 to be exact. And that was because the national 
Reinhardt's book kind of went into effect. Although, uh, based off the sources I've seen, it wasn't necessarily so much for a quality push why it was adopted nationally, but more so uh, for taxation purposes that the Kaiser was able to kind of line his pockets a little bit fatter <laughs> with uh, uh, heavy taxation on barley and hops. Uh, so if you restrict the usage of other ingredients, you know, you are able to rake in a few more shekels. And uh, But that's a story for a whole nother day. Essentially, you could say that Kartoffel beer was a casualty, a victim of World War I, uh, and it was basically extinct by World War II. However, it did kind of continue to exist in a few different ways, primarily uh, in the Americas, in North America, America, the United States to be specific, uh, especially during World War II, there was extreme, extreme food restrictions and rationing, and breweries were not able to produce beers in the way that they uh, typically would so. Uh, now, America, since its earliest days, has always been uh, a, a a fan, a utilizer of adjuncts in their beers, uh, corn being the primary one. But during this period where breweries were to cut even further short than what they probably were already doing, the potato, the humble potato made its way back in and we were able to keep brewing tons and tons of beer throughout World War II thanks to the Americanized version of uh, Kartoffel beer or probably just potato beer. But the beer I'm currently drinking now, it is German, made in Germany. And it is, without a doubt, a potato beer. So you might be asking, how am I drinking a potato, a Kartoffel beer from Germany, made and produced in Germany, despite uh, me just saying that there was a, uh, a restriction, a limit, a national law against its usage? Well, that's because of World War II. So uh, after World War II, Germany was kind of split up amongst uh, varying nations, both Western and uh, Eastern, with the, the Soviet Union actually controlling large swaths of Germany. They put in very, very heavy uh, restrictions and rationing, uh, as the Soviet Union did, uh, of their communal farms. But uh, breweries in Eastern Germany weren't able to produce all malt beers anymore. So many of them fell back kind of on their old ways, especially since the national Reinheitsgebot did not pertain to Eastern Germany because it was not German anymore, it was Soviet. The Neuseller Klosterbrau, they were one of these breweries in Eastern Germany that was uh, forced to go back and produce things in the old way, in the old Prussian way. Uh, they still to this day produce potato beer, they produce molasses beer, and that's because after the Soviet Union fell, reunification happened in Germany. They basically said, hey, this is what we do. This is what we've always done. And you're not able to influence us, national German government. <laughs> They were threatened with heavy fines. They were threatened with uh, restrictions and all these other uh, limitations that would prevent them from selling their beer. So they actually took it to court. And it was there at the court that they were able to argue that it has a historical precedence. It is what they've always done and they're gonna continue to do it regardless of what anyone says. And they actually ended up getting an exception to the policy that allowed them to continue brewing their beers. That's why the Kartoffel beer still exists in Germany to this day. It's incredibly fascinating. It's incredibly amazing that uh, just, I, I don't know if there's any other brewery out there still doing it. This might be the last German example of Kartoffel beer. But no historical beer lesson would be complete without talking about what's going on in the modern craft beer movement. Over the past 10 years, craft breweries around the world have produced many examples of tuber-infused beers in a variety of styles that would certainly meet the criteria of being called a Kartoffel beer. We've seen a huge array of different types of potatoes being experimented with. Probably my favorite is when I get my hands on like a good brown sugar sweet potato stout. Those, those are so good. But if you look around, especially in America, you probably will be able to find some form or another of a 
potato beer, a, an ancestor, a modern day version of the Kartoffel beer. And I think that's really cool. It is both a, a tradition, a part of beer history uh, across Europe and in the Americas. And I, I like to see that it still exists today. It doesn't top being able to try like a true authentic Germanic potato beer, but still very cool. In conclusion, uh, I'm a big fan of this. Uh, I mean, sure, it tastes and looks just like a, your typical Pilsner, right? Uh, because essentially it's what it is. It is an adjunct Pilsner. Uh, it still kind of has a little bit of a uh, hoppier bite, a, a chewier mouthfeel, uh, as you would expect out of a Germanic Pilsner, but certainly heavier than what you would expect out of your typical adjunct lagers, especially in America. It's kind of in a category of its own at this moment, and I find that incredibly fascinating. Anyways, like the potato, the Kartoffel beer is a hearty product that continues to survive throughout the ages, despite whatever is thrown at it, able to survive in any condition, and uh, I, I, I applaud it for that. So hope you learned a little bit about the Reinhardtsgebot, the, uh, the history of adjunct brewing, and but most importantly, this incredibly unique and special special moment in beer history, the Kartoffel beer. Thanks for watching. Remember, there is a story, or maybe several, in every bottle, and that life is brutal. Cheers.